But let's start with Gresham's Law and medals and coins. I think a lot of people are familiar with Gresham's Law. They've heard of it. They understand uh, that it's part of, of understanding money, but maybe we're a little fuzzy on it or we misstate it a little bit. Sometimes we do like we do with Say's Law. So give us your version of Gresham's Law and, and why it matters. Okay, sure. So the, the popular rendition of it is bad money drives out good. And then, you know, guys like Rothbard and other Austrians, they they take pains to say, okay, yes, there's a there's a uh, a real phenomenon that that glib phrase is corresponding to and it's very important for us to understand that. But strictly speaking, no, that statement is not correct. That in a free market, it's not true that bad money would drive out good. Just like in a free market, it's not true that bad cars drive out good cars and you know, all the cars in the road are falling apart because, you know, it just, just it doesn't make sense. You know, it, there, it's not profitable for a company to make a good quality car that's reliable because it, it would go out of business. No, that's that doesn't make sense. In all other arenas of, of the free market, quality drives out, you know, inferior products, at least, you know, in terms of if their pricing is similar. And so likewise with money, if you had privately produced monies, whether gold and silver coins or what have you, then good quality money would drive out bad quality money. People would adopt this, the money that held its purchasing power that was hard to counterfeit and so forth. So what it what it means, though, where that phrase comes from, is that when government enacts price controls um, th that force merchants to accept certain types of money, even though the it's not in their immediate interest to do so, then everybody pays in the effectively overvalued money and they hoard the, you know, the undervalued money. And so that's the sense in which what, what they mean is in a regime like that. And I'll give a, a specific example just in case people don't understand those abstract terms. But the, the point is what ends up happening if the government's making it such that you're allowed to buy stuff and force people to accept money that actually is being overvalued relative to what everyone really thinks it's worth well, then whenever you bought, bought stuff, you would pay with the money that you don't like that much. You would get rid of it because the other guy is effectively forced to accept it. And everybody's trying to do that. So everyone's trying to get rid of this under this overvalued money and nobody would spend the undervalued money. And so the, a, a quick analogy or, or example of that phenomenon would be that the modern listeners could understand if, if you've ever stumbled upon like a quarter from the year 1940, well, you know that even though it's stamped as 25 cents, the, the silver content in that physical item is worth way more than 25 cents right now. And so it would be silly for you to go use that in a vending machine or, or something to try to go buy or, you know, you go, you buy something at the gas station and the guy says, oh, yeah, it's a buck and a quarter. You would be silly to put down a one dollar bill in that particular quarter because it's it's worth way more than 25 cents. In contrast, what you do pay with are the silver discs or the, the, I should say the discs that don't have silver content in them anymore and which actually make, you know, cost less than 25 cents worth of metal in order to produce because merchants are not allowed right now to say, to say, oh, this is a dollar 25, but you got to pay me in quarters that are pre 1965. You can't do that. That right now, a quote, legal U S quarter is, is valid for paying somebody 25 cents. All right. So that's, um, it, well, it's strictly speaking, it, it comes down to the, um, you know, like the legal payment of debts and things like that. So technically, yeah, I guess you probably could put up a sign saying I only accept silver. But in general, I think the, the listener gets the idea I'm getting across here that um, just like you would never pay, buy something with a quarter that had actual silver content. Likewise, historically, when the coins really were made of gold and silver, and then there was so-called bimetallism standards where the government might say that, oh, here's the legal ratio that a dollar is defined as a certain grant number of grains of silver or, or or and gold, well, then the market price of gold versus silver would fluctuate over time. And so that's what economists would say, that governments thought they were enforcing a bimetallic standard by defining their currencies in both silver and gold. But in practice, it was an alternating monometallic standard that at any given time, the actual market exchange rate between gold and silver was not exactly the ratio that the legislators had pinned down earlier with their statutes. And so at any given time, either the gold or the silver coins were over or undervalued. And then those would be the only ones, quote, in circulation. Everybody else would sit on 
the coins that were not properly being valued by the you know the government's uh, requirement as to what the the currency would be defined as. So what do you think Gresham Law means for us today? People are worried about the dollar. They see all the monetary and fiscal stimulus happening. That's that's why I caught myself a little bit because so there was a period, you know, with FDR coming in and seizing everybody's gold, among other, besides physically taking it, they also even prohibited what were called gold clauses. So you couldn't even have a long-term contract with somebody to say like, hey, I'm going to rent your land for the next 10 years and each year I'm going to pay you the equivalent in dollars of what one ounce of gold is at that time. Like you weren't even allowed to have that in your contracts because they wanted to get people to stop thinking in terms of gold and to just think in terms of dollars. And so in a regime like that, you know, then you could definitely see that the gold would, would, you know, it would say in people's possession, they would, it wouldn't circulate as the money and people would just use the, the dirty paper dollars. Um, so in our kind of, so fortunately those sorts of restrictions right now aren't so prevalent. And I think technically, you know, merchants could insist on like, Hey, the, what's the price of this product? Well, it's, we go look at the spot price of gold that day and you got to, yeah, you can pay me in dollars for it, but the price is going to be whatever, you know, one tenth of an ounce of gold is that day or something. Like I think you could legally do that. It'd be cumbersome, but you could do it, especially with smartphones and stuff. It wouldn't be so hard, but if they were to start cracking down on that. So I think Jeff, to answer your question, if the dollar really did start crashing um, and then certain merchants try to respond in that way, like to have their prices be a function of, you know, tied to something real that, yeah, you can always pay me in dollars, but my prices quoted in dollars are going to adjust based on today's exchange rate with gold or with Bitcoin or whatever. If the government wanted to stop that and came in and then put controls in place and said, no, you're not allowed to do that then I think that's where we would start to see, you know, the issue of, of Gresham's law, in which case people would just be paying with these hundred dollar bills that everybody thought were, you know, a really terrible thing to, to hang on to. They'd just be running around town trying to get rid of these things. Whereas you would keep your gold and silver coins and Bitcoin and whatnot. Well, we've seen a real world examples of this when Zimbabwe was in facing hyperinflation, people clamored for and held dollars you know, clandestinely or openly. And, and even today, we see people in, in Zimbabwe quickly using euro and dollar, and supposedly the vendors there can make calculations in their head almost on the spot uh, b- between these currencies. So, you know, I mean, we, we do understand that that um, even in the real world, people try to get into better currencies. Exactly. And so that that shows why the glib statement of Gresham's law as bad money drives out good is not correct. That like you say, in in countries where their money all of a sudden takes a real bad turn and that's an awful money, it's not that people don't go into better monies. Of course, they, that's the natural thing to do. And so that's why you have to realize that it's not just that there's good and bad monies competing for people's uses in order for what Gresham's law is describing to come into play is there have to be price controls that the government puts in place to force people to say, no, no, you're not allowed to uh, you know, discount this particular currency a certain amount. So in a sense, it's like putting a floor under the price of the currency. 